Okay, welcome everyone. And uh, I think we can start the session. Um, I introduced Wayne Doolin, um, SOAS uh, lecturer in um, Afghan history, who is going to chair uh, this session. Uh, Wayne, um, I leave it to you to introduce the keynote uh, and, and the following panel. Many okay. thanks. Um, thank you very much, Angelica, and uh, welcome everybody. And as Angelica said, I am, my name is Wayne Dooling, and I'm a member of the department, or rather the School of History, Religions and Philosophies here at SOAS. My work, I'm an historian of South Africa. Um, my work is primarily on colonial South Africa. But today I'm here to serve as the chair on uh, this panel, uh, our very exciting afternoon panel and um, which, which is on archives, museums, and heritage as contested spaces. So first up, we'll have the next uh, keynote session, our second keynote session for today, keynote conversation, and then we'll have um, a panel of speakers. Our, the members of our keynote uh, panel, our keynote conversation. First, we have uh, Paul Basu. Paul is professor of anthropology yeah, at SOAS. Um, Paul's earliest work was on genealogical heritage tourism and historical imagination in the Scottish Highlands or the Scottish Highland diaspora. Um, but he has since moved his attention to West Africa, specifically Sierra Leone and Nigeria, and continues to work on issues of heritage around issues of landscape, memory, cultural heritage. Um, he has also worked as a filmmaker, trained as a filmmaker, and worked as a filmmaker and continues to explore the use of different media in ethnographic research and exhibition curation. Um, and is currently leading uh, an Arts and Humanities Research Council funded project uh, entitled Museum Affordances. The second member of our keynote um, uh, conversation panel is uh, Elsie Uwusu. But I think Paul will speak more directly to Elsie's um, professional, uh, professional expertise and experience. So thank you very much, uh, Paul and Elsie. So to start with our keynote conversation, and then I will introduce the members of our panel uh, afterwards. Over to you, Paul. Thank you. Hey, thanks very much. Thanks very much, Wayne. And uh, thanks to all of the organisers of uh, this uh, great event. Um, um, Elsie, I don't know if you're there. I don't know if you want to turn on your um, camera too, and then um, we'll be. Uh, oh, my camera yeah. is my camera is turned on. Ah, okay, good, great. Sorry. <laughs> you should be able to see me. Yes. Great. So, so um, well, as Wayne suggested, archives and museums are some of the most significant public institutional spaces that bring together the themes of the conference, epistemologies, mobilities and identities, and they're certainly spaces of contestation. These sites of knowledge production and representation are of course also entangled in and often responsible for perpetuating ongoing conditions of coloniality. In their modern guise, these institutions are inseparable from the histories of empire and colonialism and with Eurocentric epistemologies that have ordered the world according to particular logics and, and hierarchies. The processes of collecting, documenting, cataloguing, classifying and displaying that are associated with museums and archives are also fundamental projects of colonial modernity and are bound up in its different violences. From such collections, uh, and the principles of ordering impressed upon them, in which alternative worldviews are often relegated to the status of, of heritage, dominant knowledges were and are produced and reproduced. We can't undo history, but we can recognise and address the legacies of history, and we can acknowledge the need to repair uh, what has been damaged. And so this brings us to the main theme of this keynote conversation with Elsie Awusu, uh, the issue of kind of repair or reparation and restitution with particular reference to archives, uh, museums and heritage. So, um, so let me introduce Elsie then. Um, Elsie Awusu OBE is an architect and urban designer. She's principal of Elsie Awusu Architects member of Council of Reba, the Royal Institute of British Architects, and the founding chair of the Society of Black Architects. 
She's been a board member of various arts and heritage organisations, including the Arts Council England and the National Trust for England. And she's also director of the company Just Ghana, which promotes investment, sustainable development and constructive social engagement in Ghana. So welcome, Elsie. Um, so I know, um, I know you've been a long standing proponent of um, and, and been long engaged with the African uh, reparations movement. So uh, perhaps we could start if you could tell us a little bit about uh, your involvement uh, with this over the years. Um, well, my involvement with this um, conversation dialogue started in 1993 just about the time um, when the Society of Black Architects was formed. Um, and it started with a meeting with um, the, um, one of the first black MPs in, UK, in the UK parliament, Bernie Grant, who was part of um, a movement, it, which in those days seemed you know, completely um, utopian, called the Africa Reparations Movement. And lots of people sort of tittered and smirked at the idea that these um, up to 90% of um, African um, historical material, according to the New Accord, Accord report, um, was um, held outside the continent as a result of colonial conquest, um, plunder and outright theft, um, as well as legitimate trade and exchange. Um, so, but since then, the calls for the return of these um, treasures has gained momentum and um, has ended in the ground recently in the groundbreaking Sar Savoir report commissioned by um, President Macron. Um, the report was actually published two years ago and calls for full restitution of, of works in French museums. Um, which were plundered from former African colonies. So, so, so the idea which um, so many years ago seemed completely outlandish is gradually gaining traction. Um, so in 1996, as a young architect, I launched a competition called the Gallery for Returning Treasures. And this was co-sponsored by Royal Institute of British Architects and the Africa Reparations Movement and Bernie Grant. And um, 25 years later, I'm working on the concept of a real gallery for returning treasures um, in, in Ghana. In fact, the concept has become so popular that there are several proposals for returns <laughs> of African treasures. Um, and it just reminds me of a, of a conversation, a meeting we had with um, one of the dignitaries from Benin, um, from the Oba of Benin's court with the British Museum, which was um, set up by Bernie. He sort of said, well, you go along, Elsie, you know about these things. So off I tottered and we had this meeting with one of the keepers um, who was, you know, nice in, in the sort of Monty Python sort of way, a nice, nice gentleman. Um, and he said, well, actually, I'm very sympathetic to this, but I have a better idea. Um, we are prepared to make um, facsimiles of the, the doors, the, the, the um, archways and the various treasures that you see on the, in various parts of the British Museum. And we'll let you have those, but unfortunately we can't return the, uh, by act of parliament, we can't return the originals. Um, and um, quick as a flash, the Oboe's relative said, well, I've got a better idea. Why don't we have the originals and you can keep the facsimiles? And, that, and needless to say, that didn't go down very well. Um, but I mean, it is, pretty wonderful that um, treasures that were taken um, by British forces in 1874 um, and auctioned at Garrard's and went into the British Museum and the V&A and various places, by no means not just the national collections, um, but you know there are a huge number of these treasures and they were never intended for museums. I mean these are not museum pieces, these are artifacts and religious icons which belong to um, the custodians who are still alive and you know because of um, of the way that memory is transmitted and um, and and history is shared are still part of oral culture in Ghana 
uh, the former Gold Coast. And the custodians are saying, you know, mister, can we have our ball back, please? Um, to which the answer is, um, well, give us another 50 years and we'll think about it. Um, and I think most people would agree that's certainly not good enough. Thanks, and perhaps we can hear a bit more uh, later about the uh, the particular um, museum project that you're, you're 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 leading. Then that would be very interesting to hear about. But maybe just to pick up on a couple of the um, points. I mean, and I, I see my role here really is playing devil's advocate um, to try and open up some of the um, kind of the, the the space of contestation, as it were, around these uh, these kinds of issues because one would think it would be a very straightforward matter as you're kind of suggesting, uh, and yet somehow it is bound up with contestation, just not just of the kind of kind of legal framework that say the British Museum might respond with, but of perhaps more complex um, things. Indeed, that issue of complexity is something that um, I've, I've found myself returning to quite a lot with some of the recent debates. Um, the Sar Savoir report that you mentioned, for instance, um, really um, tries to simplify the, 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 the story. This, the, the notion of complexity or ambiguity is kind of seen as something that is um, almost giving permission to institutions to actually pause, to hesitate, deliberate seemingly endlessly and therefore not actually take any action. But um, I suppose the question is about, uh, you know, what about what happens if we actually open up some of that complexity? Um, it's interesting that the, um, the, the project that you mentioned there, there uh, refers to the notion of treasures. And in some senses, I wonder whether using treasures as the kind of um, model, as it were, to base a principle is, is part of the problem. Because, as you say, there are certain um, uh, categories of objects in, in our museums which are kind of unequivocally looted in the context of military colonial uh, expeditions and the like. Um, you mentioned uh, the kind of uh, Ashanti context and uh, Benin and so on. These are the kind of, um, kind of poster board kind of cases in a way. And in some senses, they're the simplest um, um, because it's quite uncontestable in a way than the, the, the circumstances in which they led to be collected. Um, Sans of are less, um, well, they broaden this category into, um, it, it's very clear where it, it, it ends in a way. So for instance, the kinds of material that I've been working with um, resulted from colonial, uh, for instance, anthropological expeditions where material was uh, commissioned or purchased. Um, but this is still framed within the same type of um, logic in terms of restitution. So I'm just wondering whether the focus on these treasures, the, you know, these icons as, uh, as they're framed in the kind of afford report, um, complicates things a little bit because it focuses on these exceptional objects, whereas actually if we're broadening that to use Macron's kind of framing of, to, to be African cultural heritage, they represent actually a very narrow and very elite form of cultural heritage. So what about the fish traps and the baskets and the um, all of the other everyday kinds of things, for instance, which actually make up the uh, the bulk of material in, in museums in, in, in the West? Well, um, that reminds me of a phrase that um, my lawyer uh, brother often uses, which is, we mustn't make the best the enemy of the good. No, I mean, there are huge numbers of icons, treasures, um, artifacts, call them what you will. Um, and I think the important thing is um, the process that the v is going through at the moment which is leading um, data collection and cataloging. You know, where are these things? What are they? When were they taken? Um, you know, we have that information um, in great detail, but it isn't assembled onto one database and in a, in a coherent way. And I think if that scholarly work was to be done, then we could say, let's have a hierarchy. 
you know, and, you know, who is putting up their hands and saying, all right, well, you can have Kofi Kari Kari still back. We've got it here in Pitt Rivers and actually we'd be delighted to return it. Let's start there. You know, so you don't have to agree to send everything back in order to start the process. And I think it needs a pilot. It needs um, the willing, if you like, collaboration of the willing, both in terms of the governments and in terms of the keepers. Um, there are keepers in Africa, in the Ghana Museums and Monuments Board, for instance, has a wonderful team of keepers who could very easily and happily collaborate with the British Museum and with the v &A to say, you know, let's sit around a table and say, you know, let's have some photos. Which one are we going to send back? Is it going to be this beautiful item that's going to be the first one, you know, and we go through whether it's an act of parliament or an agreement or a concordat, whatever you like to call it, and hurrah, we've got one back. But the, the fact of the matter is that we've been talking about this for such a long time um, on the basis that, you know, if we can't send them all back, we can't send one back. And I think that some, some great work has been done. I know Chris Smith has been doing work at Cambridge University about return, return of ancestral remains, for instance. You know, and there is really good work being done. And I think we should piggyback on that work. You know, we should have a database of the items, obviously, but we should also be aware e each other of, you know, of the people who are working in that space of who is doing what and um, how we can help each other. So I think it must, it, to me, it must be um, much more collaborative. At the moment, it's quite binary. You know, it's a binary position. Either you send them back or you don't send them back. But it, to me, it's much more of a process. And, and what we should be doing is to be working together to define and design that process um, so that we reach a successful conclusion. Sure. And I suppose I've been involved um, to some degree with the debates in the Benin context. And there's the kind of Benin dialogue group, which uh, Prince Gregory, who you mentioned earlier, has been a member of also for many, many years. And that seems to have gone around in circles. There, there's been quite a breakthrough there, as I'm sure you know, and uh, David Adjaye is involved in the um, uh, design and building of a, a, a new uh, museum in Benin City, for instance. Um, and um, you know, the kind of provenance research that you're talking about is going on, not least in a, a project that's being led from um, uh, Hamburg, uh, this kind of digital Benin, which is about trying to map all of those uh, objects from the 1897 um, uh, punitive expedition and, and the looting. Um, so again, I'm, I'm putting my devil's advocate hat on just to kind of open up some of the questions here. So you mentioned, for instance, the Ghana Monuments and Museums uh, Board. Um, and again, in the Macron report or the, the Sarsavoie report, um, the, the, the kind of a relationship, there's a lot placed on this notion of restitution as something that's unequivocal um, and um, the notion of the legitimate owner of uh, this heritage. Um, and um, I'm slightly troubled by some of this because in the, in, in the proposals in France, for instance, this is very, seen very much as a kind of um, bilateral national project um, where uh, objects in national museums in France are to be um, restored to or, 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 or repatriated to national institutions on the African continent. So from a national museum in Paris, let's say, to a national museum um, in Accra. Um, does that necessarily, though, um, get make these these collections more accessible um, to the actual people whose heritage they uh, represent or embody? Again, in the case of you know royal regalia and so on, it might be relatively straightforward. Um, but again, I'm thinking of the more general kind of context. Um, my experience of many um, museums in African countries is that they don't necessarily um, really engage with communities outside of um, the capitals, for instance. Um, so I'm just wondering this notion of, well, there are two things really. One is this 
um, idea, and it's mentioned in 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 Sar and Savoir's report, is this kind of incarceration of objects, so that objects are incarcerated in institutions, say in Europe. Would would some of these strategies merely incarcerate them in institutions in um, African cities, for instance? Would broader publics, the publics who are actually closest to this heritage, necessarily have greater access to them. Um, so, um, and then there's a question of what does a legitimate, what is the legitimate owner mean? And where are those legitimate owners in, a, in an age, as it were, of migration and diaspora? Can we assume that the legitimate owners are necessarily uh, sitting in the villages or towns where the material was taken uh, 100, 150 years ago? Well, we can ask the same question of um, items which are in the British Museum, which come from the UK. I mean, you know, something from the Orkneys or the Isle of Skye is just as alienated from its original context as something from 3000 miles away. So I think that's, that's, a, uh, that's a conversation, a very important conversation, an important dialogue about the role and functions of museums um, and those institutions that incarcerate items out of their everyday use. You know, and and I, I think that to me, um, this, is a, 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 this is a dialogue about um, access and democratization of knowledge. Um, now, um, I, I think there's another conversation about empire and how these items were, um, were collected not just by the British, but by say the Ashanti in the first place. You know, I mean, the, the Ashanti had a huge empire um, and, and, you know, they were just, um, you know, to use a colloquialism, um, just as much in the habit of fetching up round somebody's house and biffing them on the head and taking their stuff away as the Brits were, you know, and, and a, a lot of these items were taken by the British empire as a result of a collision with another empire, you know, and it, it is arguable that there was a big there was a big fight, and the Ashanti's lost, and as a result of that, they had um, the regalia and their treasures taken, and in a punitive way. And those expeditions were called punitive expeditions. They were sent out there to teach people a lesson, and to say, you know, might is right, and we've got guns and you haven't, so we're going to kill your lot and take your stuff away. Now we don't do that anymore. So I think part of the process of reparation is recognizing that we do not do we do not do things like this, and it was a bad way to behave. Um, and you know, the the, the Asantehini has offered an apology for slavery, um, and and other people have offered an apology for slavery. Now, uh, you know, an apology is one thing, but what what are the consequences of that apology? And there are people in Ghana who would say, you know, Ghana didn't exist when this piece, this lovely piece was made. You know, that piece belongs to my family and it doesn't even belong to my family. We are custodians of this item. And there is that concept in, in certainly in Ghana that um, whether it's land or treasure, um, the, the, pers the, the individual person is a custodian not an owner. So the idea of custodianship versus ownership, I think um, needs to be interrogated as well. So who is the proper custodian now for these treasures? Because Ghana didn't exist in those days. So it isn't a bilateral, to me, it isn't a bilateral conversation. It's about, a, it's a conversation about proper custody and stewardship and care for whether it's land or intellectual property. Um, how, how we deal with that in a way which is recognizes that we no longer have the days when, you know, blokes got up in their best bib and tucker and went off to war and some came back and some didn't. We don't do that anymore, or we shouldn't do that anymore. Um, so how, how do we manage that dialogue in a world where, you know, women and children and people of diverse backgrounds and um, orientations 
are part of that conversation. To me, it's very much set in the context of an old fashioned conversation in which, you know, we are the government, we are, we are the guys, you know, one, one bunch of guys is talking to another bunch of guys. And I just think that it just needs to be so much more diverse and so much more interesting. I think that's uh, very important. I suppose, again, this is where the um, question of hesitancy um, comes into play, because um, I mean, that the point you made there about, you know, again, this goes back to this question of legitimate ownership, let's say, and as you say, problematizing both the notion that there's a singular legitimation, as it were, and such a thing as property uh, in that in that sense or ownership. Um, so given that some of the nation states, uh, indeed most of the nation states didn't uh, exist at the time when these uh, things were acquired through whatever means, um, the placing the responsibility on the, the, uh, you know, the national museums, for instance, in, in those countries is, um, you know, I could, I could see that that becomes a complicating factor now. Um, are they necessarily invested in the same process of negotiating that, um, you know, the different claims, as it were, from other kinds of localities. I mean, um, actually, actually, Mbembe was talking earlier, and uh, one of the points he made, which I think is a very important one, um, is is relating to the local. Uh, he made the point that there's no local that is not contested. There's no indigenous knowledge that is not the object of contestation. Um, and I think this is very important. Many museums um, uh, do not speak from a position of expertise or um, deep understanding of the local contexts uh, in terms of the, the people who have a claim on some of the cultural heritage that we're talking about. Um, and so again, this notion of um, how to work through that as a problem um, if one's saying that the, the nation state isn't necessarily the legitimate uh, owner or custodian, um, but then when one's got actually uh, competition at increasingly local levels, again, it becomes challenging. And then suddenly the museum, for instance, in, in, in a European country is, is in a position where it must make a decision about these competing legitimacies uh, about which it, it's ill-equipped to, uh, to do because it simply doesn't have the knowledge. No, it doesn't, that doesn't have the knowledge, but you know, if I can talk about Ghana, Ghana does. Ghana has the knowledge and Ghana has a superb infrastructure of um, national and local jurisprudence. So, you know, and, and a discussion like this could be referred very easily to the House of Chiefs where all the chiefs um, from the, you know, from the paramount chiefs to the sub chiefs are, are, are represented. And I think that would be a really fascinating conversation to have, you know, Togbi Afede the 14th, who is currently the chair of the House of Chiefs. And, you know, if you say someone is the 14th in line, you can see how far back that, you know, that, that uh, his, his, um, chieftaincy stretches, you know, that's centuries of history embodied in that individual. And there will be many, many others in the House of Chiefs who will have those stories at their fingertips, you know, and those names like Ya Santua and Kofi Kari Kari are daily names, everyday names, and children will be continuously named after those, those ancestors. So it's part of living history. And I think all it really needs is for somebody to ask the question. But, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm afraid what's going on is people are sitting in their institutions and scratching the, in the West and scratching their heads and saying, what are we going to do? Well, they just need to get out there, get on a plane, you know, <laughs> go out there and ask some questions. Just go, go to the villages and say, you know, here's a photograph. We think it comes from here. You know, do you remember this, or do you, you know, do any, do, do any of the grandpas and grandmas remember hearing stories about this? And you will find, you will find that there will be answers. I mean, just recently we've been doing a project on um, Michael Cardew, who is a great potter and a pupil of Bernard Leach, who spent um, maybe five, six, seven years in Ghana and lived in a village in the Volta region 
And we went there and said, you know, does anyone remember Michael Cardio? Oh yes, what happened to that white man? He said he was going to see his folks and he'd be back. And that was in 1948, you know, and, um, and we found, you know, a lovely old lady of 92 who had been his assistant when she was 16. You know, so, so and, and, you know, she was talking about Michael Cardio and how they did, how they were finding clays because the clay, you know, was it the right clay was it? Um, and so these, and if he, she had died, she would have passed that on to her children and grandchildren. So these stories are there, um, but you're not going to find them by, I don't mean you, but one doesn't find them by sitting in a, you know, in an institution in Oxford or Birmingham or, or Scotland and saying, what should we do about this? You know, you just have to get out there. And if you can't get out there, just have one of these conversations, like a Zoom conversation, you know, and, you know, people in Ghana are incredibly IT savvy. Um, and you can just do a huge amount of research just by thinking creatively. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And as an anthropologist, um, the notion of just going to talk to people, it, sort of, it seems a very simple thing to do, doesn't it? Just to <laughs> talk to people. But, um, however, also having witnessed many, um, you know, quite violent um, contestations, for instance, over chieftaincy and so on. Uh, I, I also recognise, you know, uh, what uh, Mbembe was saying earlier about local contestation, where it's perhaps not quite so harmonious and consensual. Um, but actually, uh, heritages are fought over um, for, 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 for many reasons. Very, very rare. Very rare. I mean, in, in Ghana, it's very rare. I can't speak across 54 countries, obviously. But um, the contestations that make the news are make the news because they're rare. But generally speaking, you know, it, it passes relatively smoothly with a bit of pushing and shoving from um, one generation to the next. Um, and I think those, those are the, the, the areas that we can focus on where things do happen smoothly. And um, we can deal, you know, we can sort of ring fence the hugely contested ones because they, they actually do need a lot of care and expertise. But by and large, those that, as I say, certainly in Ghana, are very rare. In um, one of the problems say in southern uh, Nigeria where, where I've done some of my work has been um, really contestation over the value of old, old things, uh, particularly from um, strongly Christianized communities, for instance, who have, um, you know, who often demonize uh, anything that's old, really, not, a, not even, um, you know, uh, ritual objects or things like this. So it's a, it, it, there are complexities um, there, but let me just pick on up on something else you said, and just just to kind of uh, shout out to any audience members, do um, put so, your questions into the, uh, the the questions field, and we'll we'll, we'll come on to those um, soon. Um, the focus, as it were, the fetishization of things, of material things, seems to me something that museums uh, do. And this this quote of ninety percent of African cultural heritage is in European museums that's been used quite a lot recently, um, really is referring to a very particular category of cultural heritage, you know, things, objects. And again, in many of, um, and I'm not talking here about that, those chiefly regalia and things like that that you were referring to earlier, but the more ordinary things or, or even um, shrine objects and so on, is the fact that actually the objects aren't necessarily uh, the most important thing. It's the intangible aspects of cultural heritage. And you mentioned storytelling and, and photographs, actually. I mean, things like photographs and sound recordings and so on make up a large part of museum collections. Um, and yet none of the contention, as it were, around the fetishized artifacts really uh, is um, applies here because they're actually very easily digitized um, and um, distributed and redistributed. Um, and yet um, the value, as it were, in a way reflects a colonial hierarchy of saying actually her cultural heritage is much more about these tangible things rather than 
the intangible aspects of a, you know, whether that's a song or a dance or whatever it might be. So again, I just wonder whether the debate has been skewed in a certain way, um, which, um, you know, is, isn't necessarily helpful. Well, I, I mean, that, that sort of puts me in mind of the way we used to behave before COVID, which is that we all used to turn up to meetings, which is a sort of bizarre way to behave. You know, we, we, we all felt that the physical embodiment of our person had to be in the same room in order to show respect or care, or I don't know why we did it actually, now I think about it, it seems quite bizarre. But anyway, um, that there was always the, the physical presence of something um, has always had a magic to it. So you can see a photograph of something, but to actually see the thing itself, the, the physicality of the thing itself, even if you can't touch it, has a magic to it. So, um, and, and I you know, absolutely agree that you know, photographs are absolutely wonderful. Um, and, you know, and, and particularly for educational purposes, that is a great thing. But if we agree that the thing, the real thing has a magic to it, then why should that magic be in the V&A or the British Museum? You know, as the Ober of Benin's um, relatives said, well, you can have the facsimile. You know, if it really doesn't matter that much, it matters to us. So we will have the thing itself and you can see the picture. So, you know, there has to be equity in this, in this dialogue. Um, and, and it seems to me that the dialogue always tends to, towards, and for that reason, we will keep the thing itself and you can have the facsimile. So if there's equity in that, in that conversation, then of course, yes, you know, photographs are great. So the VNA can have the photographs and the Asante Hini can have his um, important regalia back. So, you know, there seems to, seems to me that some of this conversation is kind of disingenuous because it always leads back to status quo is best. Sure. And I wasn't really referring to photographs of objects so much as historical photographs, but, you know, yeah, ab 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 absolutely. Um, so, I mean, in the broader kind of framework of this conference, um, uh, you know, which is about kind of decolonization of knowledge and so on, um, one thing that strikes me is the museum is a desperately colonial institution. Um, and indeed many uh, museums on the African continent were established uh, during the colonial era, not necessarily as part of a colonial kind of an overtly kind of colonial project of um, kind of representation and so on. Uh, often the pet projects of people who, uh, you, know, ma you know, managed to get them off the ground. Um, the, the, certainly uh, the case in Nigeria is like that. Um, so I'm just thinking of your um, project that you mentioned earlier. Um, uh, what, what would you say a decolonial museum in, on the African continent might look like now? I mean, we, we, we tend to think of museums in this mode of a very impressive building with things in them. Um, is there a different way of imagining the museum um, of what, what was it of, 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 of repatriated treasures in Return, returning, returning Return. treasures? Yeah. Um, well, I think I think that um, you know to 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 talk about colonialism as if it is um, it, it it's it's a it's a historical an anomaly is peculiar. I mean, you know, it's been goodness knows how many years since African independence, and that culture of museums and curatorship is firmly embedded in the African culture, that is as African. You know, museum curatorship is as African a speciality as it is a European speciality. So I think that binary approach is probably outdated. But I see, I've been, we've been thinking about this a lot, I've been thinking about this a lot, um, particularly in relation to my, the, the village Vume, where Michael Cardew lived and where people are still using the kiln that was built by him and, um, and, and um, his, his group of potters. Um, they're still using techniques 
in those days that, that they collectively um, um, arrived at. And so, and in the same with the Abuja pottery where Ladi Kwali worked very closely with Michael Cardio and Clement Kofi Athe, those three great, great potters um, had such an influence on 20th century culture and, and their, their techniques are still being used. So I think there is a, a sort of a transition in uh, at the, African cult, uh, the African Museum that I see of, you know, whether it's photographs or the thing itself, the magic of the thing itself, saying, you know, these are, we people, we potters from Vume are in this tradition, you know, Mm. We're not a museum, we are making stuff, you know, and you can buy it, you know, we will make you stuff in that tradition so that you can have a piece of that history. It is not, you don't lock it up, we don't lock it up, you know, we, we treasure it, we take care of it, but we will make you a piece, you know, whether it's a sculpture of you and your, you know, your partner for your wedding or, a, a, you know, a huge planter in the shape of, a, of an eagle, you know, this is what we do. So there is um, a, a, an integrated, an integration of um, cultural artifacts, which to me are part of everyday African life and always have been. And also the, um, the discipline, important discipline of collection and curatorship. And I think, you know, giving African curators and collectors their due, they're every bit as expert and as interested and as talented as curators that, you know, that you find in the Tate or, um, you know, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So Thanks. they're part of a world, com a world conversation, an international, and a lot of the time, absolutely at the forefront of how we integrate art and daily life. Wonderful. I know, yes, I know Wayne's wanting to, uh, we've got quite a lot of questions. So uh, I think yeah. Wayne's now going to uh, kind of pick out some of the questions that have gathered. Thanks very much, Elsie. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much to both our panelists. But I mean, Elsie, most of the questions are addressed to you. Um, I mean, we've got a couple of comments. There's a comment, first comment was from Carolyn Hamilton about the importance of digital, uh, of collecting these materials in digital format. And it wasn't so much a, a question as a comment and perhaps you you wanted to respond to that uh, or emphasize that point in uh, some way or other but then we've got a couple of questions some around a common theme and I think you've addressed them in your most recent comments so there's a, a, a couple of questions that address the, the, the common theme as to whether African museums are capable of looking after artifacts that might be returned and I think your, your, the very last statement you made um, speaks to that um, but then there's a there was a very specific question, I think. Um, I mean, you obviously feel free to respond to any of these, but there was a very specific question from um, Malika Kramer um, about whether you could comment on the contestations of uh, that are currently proposed in the National Museum of Ghana. I'm not quite sure. Which, which, well, I, you'd have to be more specific. Which yeah, contest, person, which contestations are those? The person didn't actually uh, specify. Um, but well, actually, let me say, since 1993, um, pictures of Kente in museums all over the world and colonial photos of Ghana with many people throughout the Balta region, Accra and the Ashanti region, have much to say and know much about the treasures, often in very detailed ways. Um, and if you could comment on those, yeah. But perhaps the, the general question as to, because we've had a, two or three questions around the theme about the capability or capacity of African museums to, to preserve these artifacts. Well, um, um, I think it, it, there is absolutely no doubt about the talent and capacity of African curators um, to, uh, well, I mean, you know, uh, simply world class. I, I, I see no reason, um, well, in fact, I see lots of reasons to say that there are so many talented curators and systems of curatorship and the potential to set up the infrastructure. What really saddens me is the lack of resource, you know, and actually how little resource people need in Africa to just do such fantastic 
things. And, um, you know, whether it's curatorship or design or um, uh, making art, um, I think, you know, it really saddens me that with the tiniest amount of resource, people can produce such fantastic work. Um, and yet, you know, the, the, the usual response is, oh, well, we have to make um, a $50 million um, dollar application to the Rockefeller um, in order to even be able to move on this stuff. No, you don't have to do that. You know, what you have to do is to get your phone um, and send somebody $100, you know, or send somebody $500, you know, so that they can stop running around trying to decide where their next um, meal is going to come from and just have some space to think. So, you know, I think small amounts of resource, whether it's financial um, or physical, um, could just make a huge difference. And with that, you know, those, those hugely talented people who are unable to show their talent to display their worth and to display the worth of the work that they do will just come to life, you know? And I, I think it's a, I mean, I know I keep using this word, but I think it's a really potentially a really magical process um, that just requires not huge amounts of money, but just thought and love and care and attention. Uh, thank you. Um, we've got a couple. We've got a couple of more questions, but I wondered if you wanted to come in, Paul, or shall we continue? Um, to I was looking at some of the other questions yeah. actually, and I think um, what what there were there were a couple of related ones. I think David Walter, Sonia Spammer, uh, raise um, a couple of interesting points. Um, partly, one touches on the issue of kind of the you know it's a UNESCO kind of framing of kind of you kind of universal kind of heritage. Um, and the other really is about also recognizing that cultural heritage is also potentially divisive and it's not just a benign uh, thing. And I think that's an important thing. We, we're speaking about cultural heritage almost as if it's exclusively positive in its kind of way of, uh, you know, being, but it's, it, it, it can be used for all kinds of projects. So the, 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 the one question that David Walter asks, I saw, or part of that question is about, and he's referring to the destruction of um, ancient um, art, um, manuscripts in Mali, um, is when um, national contexts are, um, you know, are actually sometimes um, anti what, uh, say from a, 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 U, a UN, point of view might be regarded as, as the, the heritage of humanity rather than a particular nation state, let's say, or, uh, you know, so there's a question there which is often uh, used. And I think um, there's a very interesting point that Sonia raises about, um, in a way, the uncommoning, if you like, of, of cultural heritage, such that it's not something that's linked to a kind of cosmopolitan worldview, but, but becomes actually part of a very a deeply colonial worldview, which sees the world as divided up into a kind of mosaic of, of discrete, you know, bounded entities, and it becomes only that bounded entity, whatever, whether that's the nation, the ethnicity, the tribe, or whatever one might say, becomes the, the, the exclusive uh, right to, to access and control. Um, so I just wanted to highlight those things, which I think, again, kind of complicate um, a, 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 a narrative. If I can just add one further question, which is actually not a question, it's in the, it's in the chat. So could we please ask members of the audience to please post their questions in the chat? But I think it's an important one. So one comment is that the repatriation is one thing and it's simply the first step. And um, the question is, what do we do with items once repatriated, whether the interpretation of these items differs in any epistemological way, or whether they're just simply interpreted in the same way in a new site? Well, the, the short answer is that we don't know, and we should find out. I mean, that's part of the exploration, isn't it? So we, we, we actually, we know there will be a different narrative but we don't necessarily know what that narrative will be, nor should we, um, you know, um, and uh, second guess it. Um, I think 
you know, the, the narrative will differ from country from, to country and age to age. I mean, if you look at how, um, for instance, women's work, um, women's art is interpreted from, oh, it doesn't exist, which was the old way, you know, where were the women, um, to the, the, you know, the, the, the sort of delicate understanding that has happened. And that's happened uh, uh, over the last generation, over the last 30 or 40 years, that has changed hugely. And I think, um, I think it's a really exciting prospect to see how narratives change from, you know, uh, the, the interpretation of, you know, who was Francis Bacon? You know, who was he as an artist? Um, in those days, you know, this sort of swagger and swank and the, um, what we would consider, or certainly I would consider to be a sort of um, glorification of a toxic masculinity um, to the problemization of that kind of um, masculinity, which has allowed um, work by women and, uh, um, and um, uh, um, artists of different cultures to come to the fore and to be understood and treasured. So I think, I think and I hope that the narratives will change over a period of time, over the, the next, you know, certainly I won't be around but to see it, but uh, uh, I, I mean, I think it would be a really fantastic thing to, um, to make space for that um, change and the prospect of change um, and, 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 to, um, and to appreciate it, to appreciate the prospect. Thank you. Um, please feel free to post more questions um, in the in the chat. We have a few more minutes. Um, but there's a, another another one from uh, Katrine Vine. I think that's how you pronounce it. I was wondering whether you could say something about material limitations of the returned objects. That is, their state of contamination. How does this influence the possibilities of returned objects to play different roles? other than being museumized once again. But I'm, perhaps materiality poses a challenge toward decolonizing the logics of preservation linked to the objects as notably European, Katrin says. Was that addressed to me? Um, or either one of the panelists. Okay. Yeah. Paul, do you want to say something about that? Uh, only to say that I totally agree. I mean, it's I mean, museums and archives that matter are very peculiar institutions. The notion that we put things away in these special places in an attempt to kind of arrest time to stop uh, the process of decay or slow them down in this kind of a way. So, you know, it, it goes to a kind of more profound question around, uh, you know, to the kind of epistemological kind of context of all of this and why necessarily um, th this is why I was referring to in this fetishization of the object that uh, one finds in, in the museum context, things are not allowed to decay. Um, whereas, um, you know, uh, had, had these objects, I mean, there's the paradox, of course, that uh, when these materials were kind of collected and frozen in their state, as it were, and then shipped to these museums, they survived in contexts where had they been left on the, uh, the shrine or whatever, then the termites would have done their work and they would have been replaced and, uh, uh, and so on. So that different idea about what the object is and that whether this notion of preservation or conservation, these regimes which seek to kind of um, stop decay, um, you know, are necessarily um, you know, th 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 they're certainly not the only way one can conceive of these objects. There is that paradox, though, having, you know, taken them out of their, you know, normal, natural kind of context, as it were, where they would have decayed, taking them into this very unnatural artificial environment where they're protected from decay, they then survive. And that link, that magic, uh, perhaps that Elsie was referring to, the fact that one can, they, they, there's this kind of idea of them almost like as a time machine by being in the presence of objects that probably wouldn't have survived. Suddenly they have a, a power to transport us um, to, to, to another time. So I think that um, as with most of these things, for me at least, it's about ambiguity and, and, and complexity rather than trying to say, well, this is right, this is wrong. Um, we have these different regimes, they coexist. 
Um, and then our challenge is how do we negotiate them? What does it, you know, where do they belong? And what regimes do they belong in, as it were? Mm. Well, up to a point, but I mean, I would point out that gold is one of the longest lasting materials that you could possibly, you could possibly have. And, you know, if I refer to uh, the Ashanti um, treasures, most of the, the ones that I've seen are made of gold, uh, which, is, which, which, is why, which is why they were taken. And um, West Africa certainly has a very long tradition of, um, you know, from Mansa Musa onwards, of gold, gold artifacts and um, gold being worked. Um, and certainly um, one of the justifications given by the VNA for um, buying the treasures of the Garrard sale was that they wanted to demonstrate how skilled, um, sk how skilled gold working should be and that these were exemplary items. So I do understand that there were sort of day-to-day -day items which don't belong in museums, but there are also items which were in very, very careful custodianship. And the, the, you know, the War of the Golden Stool was about how precious an item it, it was, the golden stool, and how um, it should not be touched by people, um, it should only be touched by sacred hands. So I think there is the, there is the um, um, uh, tradition of keeping, keeping treasures very, very carefully, um, whether it's in, um, in the, the Abyssinian um, treasures, the Magdala Hort, which was taken, um, the Obuna's crown and chalice, for instance, wouldn't have wouldn't have been accessed by termites, I doubt, um, and neither would Kofi Kari Kari's stool. So, I, all, what I'm saying is that there is a hierarchy to these th these items, and we mustn't lump them all together. And we must be careful to um, to understand the context um, and the provenance, and also the magnitude of you know, 90% of those, those items which belong in, on the continent being here. I mean, that is a huge amount of work, um, both originally and now to understand, and understand the breadth of it. And I don't think we do, I certainly don't feel I have um, a grasp of the full breadth of um, the scale of the, the, uh, the items that we're talking about. There is an important point, a uh, comment made by Catalan Hamilton, which was that um, items continue to have a life once they make their ways into museums, that they, they don't become fossilized in museums and that museums themselves, uh, and that they continue to, uh, they, they continue to change um, after having been placed in a museum. I think that's an, an interesting point. But there's an interesting question, I think, that pro probably one that was posed more at historians, and this is a question by Sharon de Silva, which is about the ownership of uh, manuscripts. And the question is who owns a manuscript, for example, when the material has been recorded by a colonial officer and what ownership does the community have over such manuscripts? Um, well, I, I, I mean, I think there are different levels. There are different levels of ownership, aren't there? There, there is the ownership of the story and the ownership of the narrative, which I think is you know, pretty much universal um, and should be shared as widely as possible, whether it's in digital form or book form or what, whatever. And, and then there's, then we get back to the thing itself, you know, um, and I, I think that when you talk about um, recorded material, particularly, I'm less concerned about the thing itself. Um, because I think there was a tra tra there is a transition from um, you know the stuff the hard material to the story and the narrative. Um, so I think we should we should kind of differentiate. And I suppose that's the point I'm making is that the scale of um, the, the 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 treasure, if I use that in general terms, is so vast that we must be careful to sort of understand and particularize um what what we're talking about because if we conflate everything and say they these are about things that somebody owned then i don't think we are doing justice to the scale of the 
the conversation <clears throat> and the potential for um, dialogue and the potential for cultural understanding that comes comes with it. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I, I think I should draw this part of the session to a close um, and to to thank both our panelists, our speakers, both Paul and Elsie. Thank you very much. It was incredibly uh, interesting and stimulating. And I think uh, we move straight on to our next session. Um, um, actually, sorry, uh, apologies, Wayne. Uh, um, if we don't mind giving 10 minutes break. Yes, actually, because... I wanted to that. Yes, thanks, Angelica. Yeah. Sorry about that. It's just because on the program, we, we have the panel at 3.15, so we, we allow it for a little break. Okay. That's, that's, uh, yeah, thank you. That's absolutely perfect, because I, I, I did have that in mind. I, was, I got confused for a second. So, so thank you very much. Yeah, so let's have a little okay. break. Thank um, you very much, Elsie. Thanks, Wayne. Very much deserved. Okay. Thank you. Thank and we, we will see you back at 3.15 when we'll have uh, three, three different speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Elsie. Thank, Thank you, Paul. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much.
Okay, Wynne, you can start. Thank you. <laughs> oh, we we are back on air, aren't we? Yeah. Um, yes, we are back on air. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, welcome back, everybody, and we will continue with the rest of uh, our panel today, which, to remind you, is on archives, museums, and heritage as contested spaces. We have three speakers. Our first speaker, perhaps I'm not sure if I'll introduce each person in turn, but our first speaker is my very long time colleague, Kai Easton. Um, Kai and I have been colleagues at SOAS for a very, very long time. Um, and Kai is a leading scholar on the work of South African novelist J.M. Kutsia, and more recently has shifted her attention to um, the work of Zoe Wickham. Zoe Wickham, of course, very much a transnational author. And Kai, several years ago, organized um, a conference here in London, and um, as well as an, another one in Cape Town. And I think there was one in Australia too, wasn't there, Kai, on, um, on, Zoe, on Zoe Wickham. Um, so very much a sort of transnational scholar for a transnational author. And she's also led a number of exciting uh, projects. And the project that she will be speaking to us today is uh, the work that she did as co-curator for an exhibition entitled Scenes from the South, uh, which is about the work of um, Jane Kutsia. And I, I think, Kai, if I'm not mistaken, that I'm just thinking about the title of your presentation, that subtitle Scenes from the South, that comes from yeah. Scenes from a Provincial Life, doesn't it? Um, oh, well done, well done. And, um, and she'll be speaking to us about sort of issues um, of the archive as relating to the work of South African authors. The title of her talk is about uh, curating North-South itineraries. So um, I think perhaps, Kai, I'll, I'll just introduce you for now, and if you could speak, and then we'll, we'll go to the other speakers in turn. Okay, thank you so much, Wayne. Um, as you said, we've been longtime colleagues, so I actually just wanted to spend a minute thanking Wayne for his uh, facilitating of this to my fellow panelists, so I'm looking forward to the conversation with you and to the keynotes, um, uh, the wonderful conversation we just had with Paul and Elsie and earlier today as well. So thank you all. Also, because we're launching and Wayne and I are both involved in this whole support symposium and designing it with Angelica and Mahesh at UKZN and her colleagues there. I'm really looking at this talk as a way of thinking of the interaction between the work that I've been doing recently, but also how that inspires some of the questions that we've asked of the symposium, um, which I'll get to in just a bit. I also want to just do an anecdotal thing for UKZN uh, like Adam, I'm delighted with the link because I was a postdoctoral fellow there in uh, back in 2004, and it was actually the first year of the merger. So I want to think about that because we're going to be thinking about renaming also uh, very briefly. It was the first year of the merger, so um, it had just become UKZN. And also, I'm hoping that at some point David Atwell might be able to get into the Q&A or um, something because he also has a connection to UKZN. He was there when it was Natal, he was in the English department there. And during that time, um, the topic of my talk is also an honorary graduate of both SOAS and UKZN. J.M. Kutsia was awarded uh, an honorary doctorate by Natal back in the day and also by SOAS in 2015. So those are the nice things. Now we've had a really rigorous session on contested spaces, which really is of course what this symposium is about, but I, I realize um, in my slightly cheerful way that what I really want to talk about it is, is how contested spaces can lead to unexpectedly productive collaborations and reciprocity. Um, so those are the two key words I want to highlight. Now, from my title, as Wayne said, um, curating South North South itineraries, and then sort of on the side, scenes from the South, which is the name of our exhibition, 
and then an international exhibition on the archives of JM Kutsia, you can see these different strands. I'll probably be focusing a tiny bit more on the first few words. In general, what I'm talking about are the terms relating to the symposium. I'm thinking about directions of travel. I'm thinking about rethinking the routes in which we work to reflect in particular the production and traffic of archives in the South and the North. Rethinking what these geographical imaginaries of South and North might mean in terms of actual networks and how this knowledge is documented and disseminated and consumed as a material and creative practice and as a digital practice too. In some ways, I've just got time to kind of tell you the story about the exhibition we launched, which was um, fortuitously in early February last year. So it was exactly a year ago um, from the 9th to 11th of February, 2020. And the 9th was the signal date because that was the actual date we were marking for JM Kutsia's 80th birthday celebrations. Uh, we had about 150 invited guests, so it was a full house, which you could have back then. There were writers and musicians and scholars who all descended on Makanda in the Eastern Cape uh, from South Africa, but also from all over the world. And again, as I said, this is when most of us could still travel, just um, our guests from China, of course, regrettably could not. And Kutsia himself was there celebrating with us. Now, we had gathered him back in uh, South Africa where he was born and raised, where he was educated and taught. Uh, he was at UCT for over 30 years. We were joined in spirit and in our thinking. And I really also want to signal to our friends in Australia and colleagues in Argentina. Um, in Australia, the JM Kutsia Center of Creative Practice has been a major inspiration for a variety of reasons. And in Argentina, uh, where Kutsi has been so busy um, with a Literatures of the South program from 2014 to 2018. This together with, as Wayne rightly guessed, Scenes from Provincial Life, which is his trilogy of fictionalized autobiography. These are the guiding influences on Scenes from the South. Now, how might an exhibition of his archives from the major collection at the Harry Ransom Center in Austin, Texas, and a Marsway in Makanda in the Eastern Cape speak to the multiple pathways and geographies of Kutsia and how might we map retrospectively and cartographically his life and work in ways that might expand and diversify our readings of him. He's one of the most globally recognized writers writing today, but we also want to acknowledge, and this was crucial, we want to acknowledge his formative beginnings, in particular, his home ground of the Western Cape. What does it mean to put travel at the heart of the exhibition in its conception and its execution as a critical practice, as a collaboration. Well, the first thing to say is that we're talking about a current exhibition that involves travel, that is situated as it were, as a dynamic and collaborative work, ongoing, mobile, and that is, as I said, cartographical in concept. From the outside, it embeds ideas of mobility, it's concerned with mapping and remapping visually, critically, creatively, and translocally. It circles around a global writer across Southern spaces. Now I'm excited to use this term, which I use all the time now, because it's from a seminal conference, some of you back in the day in 1993, even Wayne might remember this, um, if you were in London at that time. Uh, Kate Darian Smith, Liz Gunner, and Sarah Nuttall organized a conference called Southern Spaces about Australia and South Africa's shared histories. So this is very prescient in a way for the kind of shaping of, of Kutsia's own work as well as my own. Now, um, this became a book that you may, you may also know called Text Theory Space. Um, and as I say, this has been a formative influence for me, but we've added some geographies to this in terms of the work we're doing. Now, crucially, our exhibition journeys along with Kutsia biographically, intellectually, well beyond South Africa, especially as it happens along the 34 degree south parallel where he seems to hover and that would be Cape Town, Adelaide, South Australia and then going west to Buenos Aires where he's been working on the project um, with uh, the University of Saint Martin as I said but also publishing beautiful new editions of his work and introductions to other classic works in Spanish. Now a quick aside but it's crucial to kind of talk about this tension and it might be more interesting um, to do that a little bit later, but his project on literatures of the South was a very literary project that had a particular agenda around language and publishing roots. 
it's a critical intervention that is uh, quite extraordinary. And he was bringing Australian, Southern African and Argent writers from Argentina all together at these symposia um, throughout all of these years. It resulted in actual new works being translated in all sorts of networks and associations. Now he wrote, um, he's given a couple of addresses on this. And one of the phrases I just want to put to stand out there, which might be at odds with the project that I'm doing is he talks about ignoring the gaze of the North. He talks about South South literary arrangements that don't have to go through the metropole, that don't have to go via London. Now, of course, there are a few contradictions here because he writes in English and he is very much a metropolitan cosmopolitan writer. But I think what we're trying to get to in this exhibition and to the work we're doing more generally is to disrupt this idea of hierarchies and to disrupt this idea that uh, you can't kind of be both or do both at the same time, by which I mean his particular intervention is, is I would say, aware of the position that he's in, but he's making a tangible um, breakthrough in a sense by, in some cases, publishing his work in Spanish before it's published in English um, as a very deliberate measure. Our itinerary plays with the three sides of his own interests, but it also plays with the South and the North. So I was delighted that Achille helpfully affirmed this in his keynote conversation earlier today when he said, there are many Souths in the North. So again, what I'm mostly interested in is thinking about the traffic between North and South and thinking exactly about that, the different South in the North. So for him, and one of the ones in which we highlighted was the South of France. It's been quite a significant site for him, both intellectually, creatively, and even athletically. And my friend Rick Barney and I have been working with John on uh, an essay film, we like to call it, um, on the poetics of cycling since 2016. And there was an installation at the exhibition to also highlight that site. Well, one of the key questions the exhibition raises is how we might problematize the idea of the South in light of three other regions that have been significant sites for him, as I've said, the South of England, where he lived uh, in the 1960s, between 1962 and 65, before going to Texas, in the Southwest, uh, which is where he received his doctorate and where the majority of his archives coincidentally now reside, okay? Um, in addition to France, these two sites. And the exhibition seeks to illustrate the kind of crisscrossing that happens when we begin to read the South and the archives in this way. When we look to the migrations of the archives themselves, their afterlives and the different ways in which their materiality is also mediated by different Southern spaces. Now I'm taking, doing an experiment as if I actually had you all in a room. The kind of thing I like to do is a show and tell, just to take a break from the virtual lives we're all leading. I mean, I think I will show you this um, on the screen in just a minute too. But this is an actual poster from the exhibition and you can just about see the dates and the locations for where the exhibition was going to be held. There are hundreds of these posters. They're stacked in our host museum, Amazwe State of the Art Building, all advertising the physicality of our exhibition scenes from the South. It's very clear from this poster that the exhibition was to have had two main sojourns in 2020, first in the South at Amazwe and then traveling, traveling back to the Harry Ransom Center in Texas. Now, um, our conference was inspired actually, again, coming back to our friends at Adelaide by their groundbreaking and highly imaginative conference and exhibition Traverses, which was to celebrate Kutsia's 75th birthday. So we were five years later on his 80th birthday, bringing him back to South Africa for another archival and literary venture. Now, Scenes from the South is the first major exhibition on J.M. Kutsia to bring together both archives from the collections in Texas, which is the major ac acquisition in 2011 that has led to a flurry of scholarly activity with researchers traveling all over the globe to see Kutsia's first drafts and his notebooks, his computer programs, his family albums, his school day notebooks, which feature quite highly in our exhibition and correspondence. And then we have Amazwi, which had in a sense um, it hadn't been fully recognized that this local museum in the Eastern Cape, which has long existed in a different form as the National English Literary Museum in what used to be called Grahamstown and is now Makanda, have their own collection of Kutsia archives. A very different curatorial uh, situation for these were donated over the years 
First editions, correspondence with other South African writers, telegrams, manuscripts, typescripts, typewriters, matchboxes of handmade vocabulary cards in English and Khoisan, English and French, and even his boyhood air rifle and cricket bat. Now think of the timing, coming back to what we were trying to do by having a traveling exhibition move between South and North. It was conceived, as you can see from the poster that I showed you, as something concrete, material, but also multimedia. This is what we imagined when we gathered together last year for the launch, and it was to stay open to the public. In, um, in fact, it was going to be featured and showcased at the actual annual National Arts Festival in June and July 2020, which also happens to take place down the road in Makanda. By April, of course, it was pretty obvious that the pandemic would intervene. So the festival reinvented itself in a remarkably short time, reprogramming the whole event as a virtual festival. So Scenes from the South was then reinstalled. They had had to pack it up and conserve these uh, very you know, original documents and items. And the amazing stuff of Amaz, we had to do that without its curators. David and I were now back in the UK. Oh, it was photographed and then designed um, on Matterport software. And you can still view this uh, just by going to the National Arts Festival uh, website of 2020. Some of the symposium questions that serve as prompts for the idea of contested spaces were actually written once Scenes from the South was on the ground and running. And so I keep trying to bring these two projects together in a certain way because I see this as a productive form of interaction. It's significant ways some of the sentence we've authored as um, prompts for speakers intended to engage dialogue with other colleagues like we're having here, working in archives and museums. Again, very different collections and very different issues that are being discussed. But it's this dialogue that I hope we continue to have, not just in this symposium, but also as we all develop new ways of looking at the much higher impact of global scholarly exchange and reciprocity. I want to go back just briefly to the origins of the event. David Apple and I happened to be working on uh, different pro similar projects at the same time, and we joined up and forged this collaboration, which was extraordinary. It meant that I had been working with Texas, David with the Maswi, and what we managed to do is have a four-way partnership between these four institutions in North and South. So I do want to thank the directors of the Harry Ransom Center and Amazwi, um, Beverly Thomas and Stephen Ennis, and all of their extraordinary staff. Now Amazwi, coming back, we're in two strikingly different venues. One is in South Africa's Eastern Cape, just down the road from Rhodes University. One at the University of Texas at Austin in America's Southwest. They have entirely different histories and audiences. And these are actually, though, entangled histories in a number of ways, even before our collaboration. Now, Wayne is going to tell me I don't have much time to talk about that. So I'm simply going to say that David Atwell, if he's here, um, might uh, write a, a beautiful sentence for us about the fact that the Harry Ransom Center was actually acquiring South African archives uh, back in the day. And it's this idea of having um, archives that actually leave the country to live abroad in Texas our vision for the exhibition was to think of a kind of corrective. Its aim was to rethink the contested spaces of archives, origins, and archival dwellings, and to imagine more creative and energetic archival mobilities. I think, Wayne, do you want me to stop? Yeah, thank, yes. thank you very much. <laughs> I have things to show you, but I think you must see them after the symposium. Um, well, we'll have time, I think we'll have time in the Q&A um, okay. for you to elaborate. So thank you very much, Kai. Uh, that was very interesting. Our next speaker is um, Ettore Morelli. Um, and Ettore is at SOAS at the present time. I'm very happy to see Ettore back at SOAS. He completed his PhD thesis um, year at um, the end of 2019, or in the course of 2019. Uh, the thesis was major study of political authority on the high felt of Southern Africa, the pre-colonial high felt, I should say, it's very, very important to emphasize that it was a, a study on the pre-colonial period, the first of its kind for a very long time. And I was uh, especially delighted to see the space that Ettore gave to the study of slavery on the high felt. And somewhere hidden in the thesis is the story of a major slave rebellion on, on the pre-colonial high felt. Um, and I will persuade Ettore to write that at some point. Um, but he'll be speaking to us today um, on 
um, work that he, I think, is carrying on from work that he did in Cape Town after finishing um, his degree at SOAS. He uh, joined the Archive and Public Culture Research Initiative at the University of Cape Town and uh, the work that we're speaking, us to, to speaking about today is specifically about the creation of an archive of, or uncovering an archive by um, an important uh, figure. So thank you very much, uh, Ettore, and um, we look forward to hearing your paper. Thank you, Wayne, for the introduction. And thank you, I mean, all the organizers for organizing this wonderful symposium. If it's okay, I will share my screen. I prepared a presentation. Uh, so let me just know if it works, should work. I suppose you are looking at, this, at the first page now. Uh, so as you, as, as Wayne said, this is an ongoing project for me. Um, even if I must say the first, um, I mean, the very beginning of this project might be found actually in the research that I did during the PhD as it's always, uh, I mean, it's sometimes the case. Um, I'll try to go, you know, straight to the point on, you know, our time constraints. So um, what I'm going to do is uh, to read my presentation and to lead it to my argument. So today I'll briefly outline an archive or a, an archival collection that does not exist yet and discuss some of the issues surrounding its possible creation. At first glance, uh, this archive appears as the product of a lifetime of research of a single man. It contains an unsorted mass of research notes, notebooks, correspondence, unmade maps, copies of books with marginalia, manuscript books and booklets and pictures. To give an idea of what I mean by unsorted, <clears throat> this is the only research tool I found the last time I visited the main part of the collection of the Royal Geographical Society in London, a rough in index that was made when the collection was accessed in England in 1994. For brevity, I begin here by referring to the subject as the scattered archive of Ronald Stratton Webb. But as I will highlight, this is quite far from being the correct definition. Before getting into the presentation, there are three preliminary key points that I would like to consolidate. One deals with space, another with persons, and the third with time. To start with, the archive is not a single unit and is not physically hosted in a single place. Its parts are in the United Kingdom, South Africa, Lesotho, and the United States. This geographical extension is surpassed by the variety of the host actors that include an established research institution in the old imperial capital, the Royal Geographical Society in London, the private papers of retired archaeologist, Tim Maggs in Cape Town, the archives of Protestant Missionary Society, the Maurice Archives in Lesotho, and the personal collection of the late historian William Lee now housed at the Utah State University. Secondly, the archive is not only about by or the property of Ronald Stratton Webb alone. As we have started to see, multiple actors are involved in its preservation. Some of them were also involved in the creation of some of the contents. Reverend Arnold Bruch, archivist at Marija for most of the second half of the 20th century, and the already mentioned Tim Maggs and William Lee. Then there is at least another scholar, Peter Sanders, historian of Lesotho. I presume that some of these names have already been heard, at least by those of you working on South African history. For simplicity, I will refer to them as academic correspondents. However, the archive comprises a much more important group of persons whose names I presume you have never heard of. They are Abraham Aaron Molezane of the Bataung, Nkata Moekezi of the Bataung, Andrew Lezodi of the Bafokeng Bapwatsa, Fred Serame Ramakabane of the Bakubung, and Felix Maketekete Sekoniela of the Batlokwa. They are the African intellectual that produce a great deal of the archive of Ronald Stratton Webb. The third point is about time. Have you ever had the feeling reading something that was written a long time ago, that those words were written for you? I mean, not maybe not for you personally, but for somebody like you, or at least for somebody in the future like you. I had the feeling twice while working on this project. So let me introduce you to my ongoing research on Ronald Stratton Webb, a prolific writer who published very little, disseminated his work among selected interlocutors, and seemingly renounced to transform the efforts of a lifetime into a final product. His literary remains remained inert and bypassed on purpose the time in which they were produced. They re emerge today and quite literally speak to us. They ask several things, including implicitly, to be treated with care. So what about the man? Ronald Stratton Webb was born in 1892. There is no agreement on the place of his birth. Quite possibly he was English. Webb served during the First World War in the Royal Field Artillery and survived the gas bombings in the Belgian trenches. 
He spent most of his life in South Africa, became a land surveyor, was a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, and died in Par in 1976. Peter Sanders, who wrote about their meetings in the, last, in, in the late 1960s, described him as a man who dressed, I'm quoting, like an Edwardian gentleman, end of quote, who was obsessed with war, was clearly still traumatized and physically debilitated from his own experience, who had been just stripped of a large part of his land by the government or the municipality in part. Webb's historiographical legacy is just slightly more defined. In 1950, he published the monumental Gazetteer for Basutoland, an erudite compilation of place names in Lesotho and the Free State that set in motion much of the peculiar personal relations that made the rest of his researches possible. From a scholarly or academic perspective, however, he played a very minor role between the 1950s and the 1970s, remaining in the background and eventually disappearing from the view of scholars. Webb had a strong connection with the Morija archives in Lesotho and sent several of his works there. Morija, however, was a marginal institution in the Southern African system of knowledge production. Within the group of academic correspondents, only Tim Max really employed Webb's researches and unpublished notes, putting them to great profit in 1976 books, Iron Age Communities of the Southern Eiffel. On Webb's correspondence, however, further research is required. <laughs> As I mentioned before, Webb knew another group of person that is considerably more interesting for our discussion today, those who I simply refer to as African intellectuals. Chronologically, the first ones to appear were Andrew Lesodi and Felix Maketekete Sekoniela in 1947, when Webb was working on the Gazetteer. We need here to start thinking of the intricacies of these relations. I show you an example from the notes that I took at the archives in London, attempting to copy verbatim. So we have here a descendant of a 19th century African king, Sekoniela of the Batlokwa, writing about 60 pages of the history of his people and sending the manuscript to Webb. The language was Setlokwa, slightly different from modern standard Sesotho. Then the manuscript was transcribed and translated with the key help of Andrew Lesodi, but much more research is needed here. After the Gazetteer was published, Webb met Abraham Aaron Molezzane in 1951, starting a research fellowship that lasted until the early 1970s. The products of this relation include the further manuscripts written in vernacular languages by African elders, then transcribed and translated by Webb, Molezzane, and other African researchers. In August 1952, Webb sponsored a journey made by Abraham Aaron Molezzane and Kata Moketsi, who were British subjects of the British Basutoland, across the Free State on the tracks of the surviving members of the Bataung and the Bakubun, two peoples who had lived there until mid 19th century. Indeed, Molezzane was the grandson of the last ruler and bore his own name. The result was a diary written by Abraham Aaron Molezzane, then edited multiple times by him and Webb, a copy of which is currently in Lesotho. I'm writing a paper on the diary, but now I can only briefly point out, point out two aspects pertaining to it. As with the previous case, the intricate relation between the authors, including the different phases of work is quite explicit in the text, which is right with marginalia and later additions, often with date and name. As you can see from the frontispiece, handwritten in 1952, two lines were added in 1958 after Molezzane had requested connections, corrections. Uh, the second aspect is connected to my preliminary thought on time. It is unclear what Webb attempted to do with the manuscript that he and Molezzane were producing. It is possible that he wanted to publish them as books, and did not succeed. For sure, these works were an unrepented claim to most of the land of the Free State province, not from a legal, but from a historical perspective. Webb grew convinced that the time was not right for such publication, or simply gave up his hopes, and noted this on the back cover of the manuscript. So you can see it was written on the 30th of January 1959. This diary with the accompanying notes could with advantage be put away for 25, 50 years. Later on in the 21st century, they may be found interesting, they may be read by Motang and Mosutu in a time of leisure, in a time of freedom from the disabilities of the present day. This is the first easy talking to me moment that I had while working on this subject. <laughs> Webb removes his work from his present and connects directly with us. The second came from a draft preface of sorts that Webb wrote in 1958, seemingly from a book that, for a book that he never published. A book, so he wrote, that ought to be strongly anti-colonial and could be read by persons far removed from South Africa and its current affairs. That book, he went on, had not been written, 
once more, he was not up to the task or the time was not right. The, sp the prospect of what would happen was hardly reassuring, a further warning of the type of mandate that Webb is trying to impose on us today as researchers. <laughs> I've chosen these extracts from individual sources within the archive because they, they work very well, both to show their complexity as sources and to question my initial idea of treating all these as the Ronald Threaten web papers or the archive of Ronald Threaten web. The question resonating here are, who is the author of each single document? Who is the author of the entire collection? How can we show the network of personal connections without dissolving the current archival structure, still very meaningful from a historical perspective? And finally, why most of the collection is in London and what can we do about it? As I move towards the conclusion, let me jump to jump ahead to my present situation. Um, as Wayne was saying, at the beginning of 2020, I joined the 500 year archive project at the University of Cape Town, where I was doing a postdoc. The project had been running for some years and it is now finalizing its latest product that we have called Emandulo, a website hosting the digital collections of several archives, museums and libraries across South Africa and Europe pertinent with the history of Southern Africa before colonialism and up to the early 20th century. The website is still in draft and is not public at the moment, so we are still working on it. A digital research tool such as Emandulo has the potential of answering to some of the queries posed by the Ronald Stratton Web Collection and similar ones. First of all, it solves the practical difficulty of traveling across three continents to work on the sources, and it avoids the political conundrum, at least you know, temporarily, of physically conveying all the papers in one place. More importantly, however, it can allow to foreground all the hands that touch and shape the papers of the collection, specifically those of African researchers, rebalancing but not erasing the role of web as collector and relevant actor, and retaining the role of the various archival institutions involved in its preservation. You get a glimpse of our ongoing discussion around these matters by looking at the titles we have currently adopted for the archival creations that we have already on the system. This is a recent innovation by my colleague, Chloe Rashevich. To conclude, what I have spoken about would not be the Ronald Stratton Web Archive, but something like the Free State and Lesotho materials collected by Ronald Stratton Web and associated items, NFHYA creation. And in our view, this difference matters. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ettore. That, um, that is very interesting and speaks actually very directly to the earlier session we had on, on artifacts um, mm -hmm. and material objects. So I'm um, very interested to hear. I love to say about that. <laughs> yes. Um, so I think we could have a very interesting conversation. Can I uh, please encourage members of the audience to post their questions in the Q&A uh, window on our screen? Our third speaker today is um, Gulam Wahed, and Gulam and I have actually never met, but I am certainly very familiar with Gulam's work, having sort of seen, seen a little stream of articles and other items appear over the years. Um, so I'm, I'm certainly very familiar with Gulam's scholarship. Gulam is a professor of history in the Department of History at uh, the University of KwaZulu-Natal. His research interests include migration, identity, identity formation, citizenship, transnationalism among South Africans of Indian descent. Um, and he's more recently worked on issues of, of sport and culture in South African society. He is the author, amongst other things, of a book called Schooling Muslims in Natal. So thank you very much, Gwilan. We look uh, forward to hearing uh, your talk uh, today. And um, over to you. Uh, thanks, uh, Wayne. Uh, I actually spent four and a half months at SOAS in, in, in 2000. I was at uh, Shula Marx uh, in the history department. Uh, it was at Ernest, I think, Oppenheim Fellowship or something. But I think you were away on leave or something, so we may have just met briefly, but I was uh, there. It was winter, so it wasn't very pleasant, but I hope I can come some other time. Um, thank you for that, and thank you to the organizers as well. So I'm going to look very br briefly at uh, the struggle over a monument to commemorate the uh, indentured experience in, uh, in, in Natal. 
Now, as background, the indentured uh, migrants, you know, 152,000 of them came to uh, Natal uh, between 1860 and 1911, and they were part of the 1.3 million uh, migrants who went to different parts of the British uh, Empire as a new source of uh, cheap labor following the end of uh, indenture. So although they were meant to work for five years, uh, and after 10 years, they could get a free passage home, uh, most uh, chose to remain in the town. Now they were both, uh, you know, this, so it's, it's quite interesting that although it's only in 2010, that's 150 years after the arrival of the first indenture, that this um, uh, impulse for a, for a, for a monument uh, emerges quite strongly. And so there are both local and global impulses for this. The one, as I mentioned, is, you know, it's a post-apartheid period. Uh, there's, you know, a, a sort of a public uh, wanting to, you know, rewrite into history the, the, the Black people's uh, struggles as well. So there's that aspect of it. But I think the roads must fall movement. So initially there was this idea that you could incorporate uh, you know, black people and leave the existing monuments, but I think roads must fall as uh, put uh, paid to that aspect. So the local, uh, you know, pressure comes with the 2010 uh, uh, 150th year commemoration, which I'll look at that. But there is also a global dimension, and this is that people increasingly find that uh, Indians in South Africa and Guyana, Trinidad, Tobago, there's a feeling that they have you know, all have troubled racial histories. And so with the emergence of India as a global power, you had uh, organizations such as GOPIO, the global organization of people of Indian uh, origin being formed. And so there's been a pressure, and, and this is formed by mainly uh, Indians based in New York and other Western countries. And, and so there's this pressure to give some recognition to the indentured experience similar to what's been given for uh, uh, the acknowledgement given to slavery. So Mauritius, which has a majority Indian population has been at the forefront of this uh, quest for a global recognition of indenture. And there they uh, built the, what's called the Apravasi Ghat, which is the immigration depot, which in 2006 was uh, made, declared a world heritage uh, site. And at the uh, UNESCO session in Paris in 2014, Mauritius actually presented a proposal for an indentured labor route project. And an international, what's called an international scientific committee was established in Mauritius in 2017 to investigate ways to create an international uh, labor route project. So that's the global aspect where there's this pressure for this Indian diaspora to be given more recognition. So locally, 2010 marks an important uh, you know, moment, 150 years. It was also the year of the World Cup. But for Indians, you know, there was a lot of uh, awakening to, to say that uh, slavery was very much, as uh, Hugh Tinker would have it, sort of indenture was very much a new form of slavery. So the, the 1860 Legacy Foundation was created. A, three-person monuments committee was formed under a person by the name of Seelan Archery, who is a descendant of indentured migrants, a trade unionist, as well as an ANC uh, member. The Zueli Mkisi, then a, a premier of KZ and set aside 10 million rand for the erection of a monument and for commemorating the 150th anniversary. So government at this time, you know, there were many factors behind that. One of them was to move Indian voters in KZN, but it was also the historical relationship between the ANC and the uh, NIC. But the first thing that this committee did is they had this huge, uh, fest, uh, you know, lunch, luncheon co commemoration, and then they put a uh, place ten plaques at a, a different uh, towns in, in KwaZulu Natal, and so by the time the public awakened to this. Uh, uh, you know, the where is the monument, the cry began, already 5.2 million of the 10 million had been spent. So they were just left with 4.8 million. But anyway, at the time, the, uh, in, uh, you know, they wanted a suitable site. So it wasn't just a site anywhere. So eventually 
At the time, you had Mike Sutcliffe, who was very opposed. He had grand plans for the beachfront area and did not want to allocate uh, a, a site for a monument. But eventually, after his departure, they were able to convince the mayor, James Kumalo, and he identified a site uh, right next to what's called the Ushaka Marine World. And it's an area that, that draws a very large number of visitors, casual as well as uh, overseas uh, visitors. And so they thought that that would be an appropriate uh, site. Uh, eventually, uh, you know, there were more uh, delays. And in 2015, I'm just going through this very quickly. In 2015, a plan was presented and the, the money, the remaining 5 million was made available to the municipality to implement this project. But this is now where you had the uh, political tensions emerging because you had the, uh, you know, a, a few people mentioned that together with the uh, roads must fall movement and the removal of the statue on, of roads, there was also uh, a, a statue of uh, Gandhi that was defaced in Johannesburg. And so Sealand was working with a person by the name of Dr. Nshlanchla Tuzi, uh, who was a, a renowned jazz musician, but who was also a director in the premier's office. And they had a close relationship. And in Sealand's word, Dr. Tuzi told him, who passed on in 2018, but Dr. Tuzi told him, it's too hot, let's delay this thing now. In other words, there was a growing anti-Indian sentiment. So it was not seen as an appropriate time to be building a monument for indenture. So you had an organization called the Mazibuya African Forum, which was formed in uh, 2012. And they issued a statement at the time that it would be a monumental insult to African leaders who uncompromisingly defended the length and breadth of KwaZulu Natal to commemorate the arrival of indentured laborers. So they argued that actually the arrival of indentured uh, workers reduced the bargaining power of Africans with the white uh, colonists. And so they, you know, there was sort of no need to recognize that. And so they looked at it as, a, as, a, as an insult to them. So you had the, uh, you know, history of racial tensions, 1949, 1985, South Africa was witnessing xenophobic attacks since 2008. You had the defacing of the uh, Gandhi uh, statue in Johannesburg. So for all of those a reason Siren and Dr. Tusi decided to hold on with this uh, project. So there were clear differences amongst, you know, Indian and African stakeholders, where, you know, as uh, Daniel Wolkowitz and Lisa Noah write, that divided societies often marked by divergent and often competing interests and different stakes in how histories are represented. So you also had at this very time, the EFF, which is emerging as a political force also making lots of anti-Indian uh, utterances. So that was one factor that led to the delay of this. But the second factor was, what should the actual design of this be? And so the municipality uh, you know, appointed architects and they had in mind something very grand, like uh, what's at, at the Mandela site in Harwick. You know, it's a world-class tourist attraction and that's what they had in mind. But so they put out the, uh, bids and they got 10 designs. And when this was shown, I mean, Seelan and his committee was aghast at what they saw. You know, as uh, uh, Seelan told me in an interview, these artists didn't have a clue as to what we wanted. During all our deliberations, we had been saying, we want to commemorate the 16th of November, the first people who put foot on this soil. The other history of Indians is captured in the museum. He said that the designs are so far-fetched, you would have to walk twice thrice or four times to make out what the hell is in there. Uh, what is the word for that? Like uh, modern art is uh, abstract. Those were his exact words. So he found it too abstract. And if I, uh, uh, you know, he had, uh, he was very clear about what he, and he actually provided a sketch. And if I can just show that for a minute. I don't know if, um, are you able to see that? Yes. Okay, so that's a sketch of what he had in mind, you know, something very simple and, uh, uh, you know, I wouldn't say simple, but something that's very, uh, you know, clear and sort of, uh, whereas the architects had in mind something more abstract that would be, attract a world 
uh, class, or you know, world uh, people from all over the world may want to come see this particular uh, monument. So, so there was on the one hand there was the uh, diff the political tension, and then you had the uh, uh, differences over the design. And so, in the meanwhile, just tell me when I got a minute or so, I'll, I'll stop. Uh, you had community getting frustration. So every year. And, and what's really ironical, there, there was, there was a, a lot of political pressure being put. Every year in November, a Syrian would be accused of stealing the money, whereas the delays were caused by the design and, and, and the... And yet, knowing full well that there was you know, no uh, monument in sight, there was no design even approved, in, in 2016, all of the, the, the political uh, uh, you know, players so they, they had a sword turning ceremony to say, you know, that everything's approved now in three months time, this monument is going to be put up, it's going to be ready. But they didn't even have a, a design in place, but it was just that they were trying to give in to the political pressure that they were facing. So uh, to this date in 2020, again, it marked uh, 160 year anniversary. So 10 years have gone by and there is still no uh, monument. The money has actually been taken back by the, by the provincial government because you know, they have a policy, if you don't use up the money within two years, then they take it back. So at, as things stand, just to round up, since 2010, this demand has been getting louder, both due to local and, and global uh, influences. The memory of indenture is of course a very painful one to most descendants of indenture, but also people like Seelan and, and the late uh, Sutish, Satish Dupilia, who's a great grand, great, great grandson of, uh, of Gandhi and who unfortunately died as a, during the COVID. Uh, you know, he said that it should also be a, a sort of a symbol for, for social cohesion. People are drifting apart as South Africans. We come together what we need to, but we definitely need to come together again. So in other words, uh, many Indians also want to use what Christina Loop refers to the monument as a cultural diplomacy and to show the sacrifices made by Indians at a time when they feel that they are being marginalized in terms of uh, affirmative action and BEE policies. And, but I think also that, you know, as many have written that the political climate uh, determines what can be done and what cannot be done. So 2010 was right, there was a euphoria over the World Cup. Uh, Zuma had a very close relationship with Indian businessmen and so on. But I think we are living in a very different uh, time in 2020. There's massive unemployment, uh, you know, racial tensions across different, uh, uh, in, in various avenues are, are, are on the increase. So I think that to try to get, the, even though there is a lot of pressure locally from Indians for this monument, uh, on an international scale, there's a lot of pressure now to get for the United Nations, for UNESCO to have a global uh, indenture route. I think that you know Indians who do feel excluded from the post-apartheid nation state, uh, I think it's going to be a while before this monument sees the light of day. And the anthropologist Thomas Blom Hansen, you know, he spoke of that this will likely enhance uh, what he saw uh, refers to as Indians. Uh, feeling a sense of uh, loss. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Gulam. That was uh, incredibly interesting too. Uh, we don't really have very many questions in the Q&A uh, section, um, but we, we have one, which is a question to Ettore about uh, your comment, Ettore, about having a fe feeling that the archive that you were collecting spoke to you directly and uh, perhaps if you could elaborate on that but then I if we don't have more questions from members of the audience I have a question perhaps common question to both uh, Kai um, and to Gulam which is about audience um, and and these exhi I mean, in a sense we're both talking about exhibitions and Gulam you speak about monument and I wondered if you could say whether um, or the, the people who are behind are trying to make the monument happen. I wonder if you could say something more about who they imagine the audience to be and what it is that the monument is, you know, who, who's, the who is the monument to speak to and what is it to say? I mean, I know you, you, showed, us the, you showed us the image that people have in mind and clearly there were very clear images to 
uh, you know, suffering and production, clear image, there's a very clear image to sugarcane, um, a reference to sugarcane in the image. Um, so I, I just wondered if you could tell us who, if, if indeed there is a single audience in mind, um, but if, you, if perhaps people have thought about that. And then for Kai to um, a kind of question about audience, and I wondered, Kai, your, you know, the exhibition that you curated, um, uh, who, who was it aimed at specifically? Okay, uh, would you like me to go first? Anybody, yes, but you should. Okay, yeah, so as I say, one of the reasons that, that there is a delay was over the design because the 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 architects, uh, you know, wanted something uh, that would sort of be of an international attraction. So that tourists from different parts, when when they're visiting South Africa, they would say, "Oh, let's go to you know, the waterfront. Let's go see this monument." It's some. The, so I don't know if any of you have seen, but you know, the Mandela's. Uh, a site in Harwick as something that people would actually go out of the way to go and see. So that's who they had in mind that it was not a specifically Indian uh, audience, but it would just be something that, uh, you know, they didn't give a proposal of what they wanted uh, or, on paper, but they wanted something that would captivate tourists no matter where they came from, uh, you know, just to see it for itself. Whereas the organizers, on the other hand, they have a very a specific agenda, which is, you know, two things. On the one hand, they want to, sh they want other, the, the younger Indians to come and see this and appreciate the suffering that the, uh, the you know, original migrants uh, went through in, in building this, uh, the economy of KwaZulu-Natal. But they also want a message to be sent to non-Indians in, in the province, especially at a time when this heightened uh, race tensions to say that we played our sort of forefathers, mothers, you know, we played a very pivotal role in building the economy of this region and we should be given equal stake in the present time and not be marginalized. So I think they have a very special, I mean, they have a specific focus, uh, purpose in that. But I should also add, there's also pressure, uh, not pressure, but suggestions from people like uh, Ashwin Desai and Professor B Bridge Maharaj, for example, who, who, who have uh, you know, suggested alternatives to just a monument. So Professor Maharaj says that you know, the Warwick market area in Durban was originally an Indian market and now it's primarily uh, an African you know, uh, clientele, but also many Indian stallholders there as well. And he says, let's have a, a, a living monument to honor the arrival of Indians, because this area is ideal. It reflects a vibrant race, a mix of race and ethnicity, which is sorely lacking in this multiracial, multicultural uh, city of ours. And this is one site where there is a degree of, of um, you know, mixing. And so let's make that into a living monument to the indention that would be a far uh, better uh, you know, uh, means of, of, of remembering. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, it's of course, it's a, you know, the, the, I guess the position of Indian indentured laborers in, or at least the descendants of Indian indentured laborers in South Africa is rather different to say Mauritius, where uh, descendants of indentured laborers, they are not marginalized, um, or certainly don't feel marginalized in the way that you describe for uh, people of Indian descent in South Africa. So I think that's, I think, you know, I guess the point is that your the, uh, the quest for the monuments speaks so very directly to present day politics rather than a, a sort of historical agenda, I suppose. Um, but um, I'll, 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 I'll leave it at that. Um, Kai, I wondered if you... Uh, yeah, hi, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Wayne. I mean, in a way, it's an interesting question to have to answer for an exhibition that was live for only about six of the weeks or less that it was uh, meant to be visited. And one of the things we expected to see during the National Arts Festival that we expected to go to and, and engage with the public that voluntarily you know, came, wasn't invited and, and just came a public viewing, as well as the education um, out, you know, engagement things we were going to do would have given me a more tangible sense of who that audience ended up being. Who it was for, um, 
I, th I think really we were trying to, one for the Katsia scholars, which are, you know, it's a, I realized that in this particular audience that that would be too restricted. So we really were trying to both speak to a Katsia audience, which he has such a huge readership. I mean, he really is the most global writer South Africa's ever had. But we were also trying to make that story um, more localized, very much more specifically, and beyond the actual manuscripts of his drafts of, of, of uh, novels, there were just so many, um, and, and here I'm sort of appealing to you, Wayne, is that um, when I, I haven't really shown you any pictures yet, but you can imagine that since the archive included many other artifacts, many other school day materials, now this means we're talking about seeing South Africa in the 1950s rather than in the 2000s. This means we're not just seeing his first writing as an adult, but we're also seeing how he was educated. We're also seeing the collection of photographs and albums that his mother, more or less, I sort of argue that she curated these. So all of these actually disrupt a, a uniform literary picture of Kutsia as a writer by, by making you think, and I'm hoping in new ways biographically, by which I'm still putting, you know, certain reservations there. When I said it was inspired by scenes from provincial life, that's a fictionalized autobiography. So I don't want to, um, say that we're trying to, in the exhibition, simply write an autobiographical or a biographical story uh, to, to provide any kind of, you know, historical evidence. But we are trying to flesh out a social history that is behind a lot of the writing and also to engage other publics. And the geography um, notebooks from when he was about 10 or 12 show him, uh, this is how it would have been back then. You would have had notebooks that you had to write in in class you would have had to actually write history exams with the names of these colonial towns that we now know. You know. And so you get a real sense of the shifting political uh, geography, as well as the shifting, shifting ideas of history in the work too. So we're hoping it's also um, interesting for other academic disciplines, but also for the wider public who may have lived through these lives and times. Thank you very much, Kai. I, I've got a follow-up question, but I perhaps the reserve for later. But um, actually, I wondered if you wanted to come back to the question that was asked of you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Wayne. And uh, um, yeah, first of all, I, I see from the way the, the, the question was posed that um, there's also a mention of moments of particular moments of frustration in, in my research. I mean, in the research pro process, I mean, in contrast to that moment of, you know, is he talking to me? And I must say, yeah, frustration, uh, I don't know, you know, for, for my colleagues, I cannot speak for them, but frustration is definitely a lot more frequent than, you know, that feeling of, wow, this is great. <laughs> In this case, I was actually looking for those documents. So it was also a moment of real, I mean, what I can consider a, a sort of discovery. Uh, but then, you know, the process, and I, I'm tr I've tried to, you know, put that forward during my presentation, because I think it's, uh, it's pertinent with the way we, we maybe not think about uh, time in, 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 those, in those institutions. Um, well, I was first very happy that I discovered the, those documents, then I felt uh, compelled to do something with them. They were clearly asking to, you know, to, to be put out. It was almost exactly 50 years later. I mean, when I discovered them in 2016. Uh, so, you know, you, you would say, okay, this is just by chance or, or not. But anyway, it's about time to do something. And then, of course, you, you start to think, you, you, you should start to think it's, that's too easy. You know, there, there are different, I mean, those are not natural. Uh, the, the, you know, the agency that a document has is important, must be taken into account. The way the, the author has, has, you know, has conceived them and wanted them to be, to become, uh, needs to be taken into account. So this, all, this is also, you know, the, the, the process that went on from the moment I, I started to read them uh, until, until today. And, and I must say that process has then enveloped the entire uh, collection uh, more broadly. So, just to, uh, to elaborate a bit more, um, when, when, I, when I first presented this, the, I mean, the first papers on, on the project last year, it was almost exactly a year ago in UCT, uh, in Cape Town. And, and by the way, I think that, you know, traveling is also another important part of our, of, you know, of our job. 
in my case, it was just because, just because I, I traveled there, uh, that I started to receive incredible feedback on this project, including uh, being, you know, in, starting to be in contact with, uh, and it, I know it's been mentioned in the chat, Prof. Levo Molezzane, a, a descendant from uh, Abraham Aaron Molezzane, who teaches at the University of KwaZulu Natal. Uh, something was completely out of my reach if I had remained in Europe, just to say, you know, just to say it in passing. Uh, and then I was meant to go to London and do this research, and, uh, and I literally could not because of COVID. Uh, the week before I was about to, to, to travel. But, you know, back then, a year ago, I was still thinking about this as the, uh, really, the, the papers of, of Ronald Stratton Webb. And, and yes, he was in contact with those interesting figures. And, and it was because of the feedback that I received in, in South Africa, because of the criticism that I received from my colleagues in South Africa, that then I realized that the frame was slightly off. And it was a frame, uh, Possibly now I, that I look at, at that, also dictated by the way the you know the archive was built. When I briefly managed to, to look at the documents in uh, in, in Lesotho and, uh, and and in London, because it was the Ronald Stratton Web Papers, and and then you could find yeah those other names in, you know mentioned marginally. Um, and so now that uh, I could not do that research for uh, an entire year. And I had a lot of time to think about it. Um, and there might be the possibility of building a digital you know, tool on this. I think it's just important to highlight that those, uh, you know, the, those structures are, that are such integral in, in the way we learn, we read documents, uh, can be remade in a different way. Uh, and that was you know, one of the points I wanted to, uh, to make in the in, in the presentation. Um, but also, I, I'd like just to briefly comment on, um, I don't think he's, he's here anymore. Uh, you know, Paul mentioned this idea of the archive as a sort of, um, I, I think he said a, a time machine. Um, and it's also, I mean, something interesting, I think, to think about. Um, or a place where documents and, and items are preserved unnaturally. Or are frozen, and I know that uh, Caroline Hamilton has already commented on on, on that particular notion. Uh, but you know, I, I must just say, documents age in, in archives. They they are you know they are consumed by time. I mean, they actually they are the the time machines. I mean, they travel to us. <laughs> they is not the archive that you know that do the tricks. And um, and just to to add another brief. Uh, you know, piece of thinking on this project of digitization. Um, I think it's easy to see them as a sort of incredible and powerful tools that, you know, will preserve uh, those documents forever when I mean, allowed to, um, you know, to, to give access to them to an incredible amount of people. And that's very part of the game. I mean, it's very much part of the game. But at the same time, digitizing an archive is a very dangerous procedure for the documents themselves from I mean that means unpacking unboxing scanning you know each page one by one very fragile documents and uh, in some occasions I I encounter damaged documents because of, of projects of digitization uh, which is something that's also it's part of this new uh, you know um, new type of projects that are becoming very very common nowadays. So I don't know if that's um, more or less, uh, you know, an answer to at least some of the of, of, of the points you wanted to elaborate and me to elaborate upon. But thanks, Tori. Well, if I can share an anecdote in in response to your point um, that documents age in archives, they are also actively destroyed in archives by yes. uh, people who are called archivists. <laughs> um, so in the case of the South African archives, I, several years ago, I went to visit the Bloemfontein National Archives, South African National Archives in Bloemfontein, the old, the old Free State Archives, because I had in mind um, that I wanted to do a project on the 19th century Free State. Um, and so there were several kind of, you know, I, I, I made two trips. On one occasion, I was a kind of trip just to identify what was there. Um, and so, uh, you know, several, 
uh, you know, literally we spent hundreds of volumes of uh, magisterial records, records of different magisterial distilleries, that is. Um, and I identified these records and thought, well, that's, that you know, would be the basis of a great project. Um, I went back uh, two or three years later and these records that I that I'd identified were destroyed by official order by the head of the by the head of the Fontaine archives. And of course you can imagine I was utterly aghast at this and so and asked, you know, what, what the reason for this was. And the reason was that nobody was using them. Um, and hence the head of the archives thought that these records should be destroyed. So effectively what that means is that you know the, the, the Bloomfontein archives, you know, these are national state archives have been identified as, as archives for the South African war, the Boer war, because that is what people come to look at. So people, the people who come to the Bloomington archives are coming to look at concentration camp records. Um, and so the head of the archive decided that these uh, were the only records worth preserving. And then of course, records of the 20th century, the liberation struggle. Uh, <laughs> the great bulk of the Free State Republic records have <laughs> all been destroyed. Um, so that's uh, I wished I could write it up, but I feel that um, I should have. I, I, when I when we put this panel together, I thought of of trying to write a paper on this, but I felt that I didn't have enough to write a paper other than to say that the records were destroyed. <laughs> yeah, Can I just say something? <laughs> Can I just add to the, uh, say something there? Yes, please. Go ahead, Gulab. Yes. Yeah, no, I had the same, I, I mean, I, I had a similar experience because I was doing some research on a particular individual and I came across this court case that took place in 1906. And it was, it was really very interesting because, you know, the judge said that the person should be So I, I got to the archives and the, the whole file is missing. So, you know, probably his family members or somebody just took it away. But coming back to, you know, um, the point is if you go to say one of the archives in London, there's a, a lot of, care, they used to be, I don't know now, but a lot of care about wearing gloves and how you can work there. But in the South African archives, say in Marisburg, you know, they just give you the files, what you do with it, you take it away, you scan it, how you use it. And by the end of it, you'll find all little bits of, uh, you know, mess there. So I think uh, if it's done under a controlled procedure, it's a one-off where you're scanning it, it, it's better than lots of different people coming with no uh, oversight as to how you're using it. And, and definitely there's far more damage being done there. Thanks. Um, but, you know, the, the point is that the archives, that these, you know, this was a clearly a, a kind of political act. Um, you know, it was a certain kind of areas of the South African past were decided as kind of worthy of preservation and others not. Um, you know, so it really, talking about contested spaces, you couldn't, couldn't think of a more kind of apt example. Um, when can I just ask you exactly about the gatekeeping for that decision? Do you have a sense of, was it just one person or was it a... a... Well, I, I couldn't, um, I... I think it was probably a committee, I suspect, um, but it certainly was ratified and signed off because I spoke to the person who was head of the, you know, uh, the main person, head in charge uh, of, of the Bloomberg Archives. So, yeah. So, you know, and, and this is, you know, it, it meant that also a key kind of canon of, of, of um, you know, what historians regard as, you know, at, at, uh, absolutely kind of critical which is kind of footnotes you know? <laughs> and the point of the point of historical footnotes is that subsequent researchers can go and look at those footnotes and you know check them out follow them out ver verify their accuracy etc etc so you know the big book of course on the free the two two big books on the 19th century free state the one is by Tim Keegan and the other one by, by, well, Colin, by, um, Colin, by Colin Murray and you know so you can't follow up Tim Keegan's footnotes because the records have been destroyed. <laughs> um, Wayne, I just also wanted to hit on the captions that Ed Toy was talking about too, because that's just so important for what you decide to keep and, and how you're going to look for it and how you're going to find it. So in a sense, you know, that archive that was destroyed could have been 
filtered out in a very different way and could have been yes. called other things, couldn't it? Yes. yes. I mean, of course, the same thing happened in, uh, I mean, in, in the Cape archives, except in that Cape archives are sort of recorded as uh, these archives were weeded. That's the word that the archive used. So, so you know, lots and lots of records on uh, the Cape Colony for the 19... Uh, 20s, 19 teens, 1920s, 1930s, they've all been, uh, they've all been not completely shredded, um, but a lot of them have been shredded and some records have been kept. So criminal records, some of them have been kept. The most frustrating aspect of that is that sort of one doesn't know what the basis of the, of the decision was uh, for what was kept and what was destroyed. As far as I could work things out, um, as far as I could work things out. Um, the um, the basis of the decision was whether they, uh, actually I was thinking of criminal records specifically, and the basis of the decision was um, whether um, things were interesting from a legal point of view rather than an historical point of view. Um, and of course, you know, the, the, the head of the archive was the person who, who decided that. And I don't think there was any consultation with historians at all. Um, so, um, when, if I, when if I may, I see that there was um, a question for, uh, I mean, for Kay, for me in, in the Q&A box uh, um, on the, well, in my case, I oh, yes, just come in, yes, yes. Uh, I, I, su I, I suppose in my case, it was about the unifying role of, of web for, for these different geographical, I mean, this, this dispersed archive, uh, if I got it right. Um, and I think it's, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm quite inclined to, I mean, to retain this figure, this, this personality as a sort of unifying trend. Because first of all, uh, he, he was the collector of, of most of those things and he was the, the, the person who sent them away. So when, when they are not in his private collection in, in, in the Royal Geographical Society, because he chose to, to send them away. So the point is not about uh, removing the person entirely, but you know, not to consider him as the, uh, the in, in, in a way, the only owner. Uh, and, and we've spoken in, in the previous keynote about you know, different levels of ownership and custodianship and curatorship possibly. So you know, that's a different way, finding a different place for the man who is still you know, the identifying figure at least in my, I mean, my, in my present understanding. Yeah, thanks, Ettore. We have we the um, the webinar will turn off automatically at four thirty. I, I was okay. just told, so we have to end. So we have, but we have time. I think for Kai. Just quickly to answer. Final, my... final, you have eight minutes, Kai. So don't, yeah. don't rush. Um, uh, well, I mean, Rick, um, my dear friend Rick, has given me a tough question, but it's um, it's a really interesting question about about again coming back to what is a cartograph cartographical approach to somebody's life and times across these different sounds, but also how does that maybe disrupt? What are the differences that remain? And what I haven't dealt with in terms of audience yet, Rick, I mean, Rick and, um, and Wayne from your question, is precisely the second leg of the exhibition, which is Texas. And so what we would also seeing, I don't think I'm going to answer Rick's question properly, but I did want to address the fact that the, the audience that I see researching at Texas and the audience that I see going to an exhibition there where they're very used to hosting exhibitions, there's one on all the time. It's, it's a big venue when you walk in. So it's, it's a culture of exhibitions of archives and paintings from the Ransom Center. But this is a very global collection at the Ransom Center. It is Texas, but at the same time, it's one of the most global and, and uh, you know, quite affluent collections. So when you see Kutsia at Texas, we, we are going to do this particular theme, but I think it is going to be seen regionally in a very different way in, in the North, um, partly because his readership is so global. And by bringing him scenes from the South to the South, what we were trying to do was to disrupt this idea that despite the fact that he's lived in Australia for nearly 20 years, there's hardly a person who doesn't go back to the beginning of time and talk about him as if he's still absolutely in the same space that he was when he began writing in the 70s and that he's, you know, they call him a South African writer. Well, we wanted to honor that that formation is so important to understanding him now too. But we also wanted to look to see what the South, if we think about it differently, like with France, and we think about his own excursions to Argentina. 
how his readership and his writing can be read in a very different way and expand and diversify, both in terms of your understanding about his interest in languages, which are evident in the archives, and in terms of, um, uh, just to come back to what I really wanted to say is that it, displaying archives means that you are a different kind of gatekeeper, visualizing, deciding how you want to thematize this and what you want to show and where you want to show it and in what order and in what space, partly depends on the venue and what they have for display cabinets, but it also depends on what you as a curator are trying to tell what story that is. So that's, that's my answer. Thank you very much, uh, Kai. Um, we, we have uh, two or three more minutes. So if anybody wants to come in, we can certainly accommodate you. Otherwise, we'll throw things. To I'll, I'll, just, yes. I'll just make a last point. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. your point about Mauritius, I think it's very important because 70% of India, of, uh, um, um, you know, Indians make up 70% of the population in Mauritius and controlled country, basically. And so a lot of uh, what you see uh, globally is from, from Mauritius and increasingly from people in India as well. Whereas, you know, prior to this 20, 30 years ago, so the people of India disowned those who are from the indentured and their descendants. And so now there is an embracing of that for, for, for the last 20 years. So that's the first point. But also increasingly the kinds of issues, say, for example, Indians face in South Africa, you find that the people of Fiji, of Guyana, of you know, Trinidad, they're all writing about the same issue. So they have now once a month these uh, uh, Zoom conferences and people from different diasporic settings. They, it's called Girmi Chacha. Like a dis Girmi means is a, is a corruption of the word agreement that people sign. So it's Girmi. And so there are people that, that, you know, there's an increasing sort of a awareness of being an Indian. In, as, a, as a minority in various uh, settings. And so that identity is becoming quite strong, uh, coupled with, of course, the, the rise of India as well. So that's something I thought I'll just throw out. Yeah, yes, thank you. That's very interesting. I mean, interesting thing about Mauritius, of course, is that these uh, the records of indentured laborers are shocked. They're not accessible to, to the public. So yeah. you, you, can't, you, can't, you can't readily walk into those records and look at your ancestry. Um, okay, well, thank you very much um, for uh, our session today. I'll, and thank you very much to our panelists again. And thank you to Angelica for holding it all together. I think we had an exceptionally successful day on our first day. This brings us to the end of our first day. And we will continue tomorrow. Um, I forget what time we start, Angelica. I can check the program. Uh, yes, uh, we're starting tomorrow at 9 a.m. UK time, 11 a.m. South African time. Okay. Please check our uh, website. I put the link in there for the program. And if you haven't registered on the Zoom link, please do so tonight to be ready for tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will say goodbye to you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye.